Steve Zeltzer. I'm a member of the Transport Workers Solidarity Committee and also I do a radio show on KPFA called Work Week. And that show is uh, was on this Monday and uh, we're, this program actually is being streamed live on KPFA so that people all over can watch it. If they can't come to San Francisco, they can watch it anywhere in the world actually. So this is an important development of using communication technology to get our stories out. So I want to Thank you for joining us tonight. This is an historic meeting, and our first speaker is uh, uh, Local 10 Secretary Treasurer, Farless Daly. I wish I were able to be here with you today because I cannot imagine a better way to celebrate May 1st, International Workers' Day, than to be able to hear NUMSA union official Umpazi Makongo address gathering convened by ILW Local 10. When Jack Heyman invited me to participate, my first reaction with this encounter between the most radical union in South Africa and the most radical union in the U.S. was one of those historical moments no serious activist concerned about the future could afford to miss. Unfortunately, I'm currently teaching at UCLA and I'm unable to be with you in person. But I do want to express my solidarity and support from NUMSA as it is an unwaveringly represents the interests and aspirations of workers and all of those who continue to struggle for a socialist South Africa. Like so many others around the world, I was intentionally incredulous when I learned about the Marquena massacre. How could the new South Africa be so aggressively <clears throat> in the old era? How could the ANC engage such murderous repression? But then I thought about Stuart Hall's animation that there is no guarantees and that in fact the struggle continues. The ANC has unfortunately aligned itself with the repressive forces of global capital while NUMSA represents the possibility of fulfilling the historical promise of struggles against racism, class exportation, gender violence in South Africa, thus also for the world. I send greetings and solidarity to all of you who will be participating in the events at the Local 10 UC Berkeley in the Black Repertory Theater. And to Mfuzi Makongo, we support you and are prepared to continue to aid you in your struggle to free South Africa. I just, I would just like to recognize one of our business agents in the back, Brother Philippe Riley. And I would like to introduce you to Local 10 President Melvin McKay. Thank you, brothers and sisters. I'm glad to see this room filled for a change. This is like, uh, like Pete said, this is a historic event to see unions come together, to hear what's going on in the other side of the world. And without further ado, I'd like to bring Mufsi up. Thank you. I'd like to present this brother with a few gifts. We have a, a book here from Harry. This is the history of the RWU. We have a t-shirt. I might have to get you a smaller size. <laughs> oh, and most importantly, the hook. Everybody see that? Dear brothers and sisters, Clarence Thomas is going to come to the mic before Monsey, please. Uh, he got a few things to also say. Thank you. One of the good evening, brothers and sisters, friends and comrades. Um, one of the people that I will be speaking about tonight, Brother Leo Robinson, who played such a critical role in the support for South African liberation struggle and for all Southern African nations. Brother Leo Robinson passed away a little over, we had a memorial service a little over a year ago. He designed the t-shirt that I'm wearing, the Million Worker March t-shirt. I'd like to present that to you. <laughs> Along with the Million Worker March DVD that took place, it will be 10 years ago this October 17th. 2014 at the Lincoln Memorial and a little over a year ago your South African ambassador 
came here to Local 10 and presented the Nelson Mandela Freedom Award to both Leo Robinson's widow, so Leo was presented that award posthumously, as well as the officers of Local 10. And this is a, an article with the South African ambassador presenting the award to Leo's uh, widow, Johnny Robinson. Thank you. And finally, uh, I'd like to present Mfuzi Mkogo. That's the click song. <laughs> I learned that from Miriam Makiba. Uh, anyway, Mfuzi with uh, a poster of ours from May Day 2008. We shut down every port on the West Coast to demand an end to the wars, imperialist wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mfuzi Um, sign and display workers union and also received a solidarity message from the Doro Chiba, the railway workers who are also fighting privatization and repression in Japan and also fighting nuclear power. Um, but before we uh, go on, we want to um, present a gift to Howard Keeler who introduced the resolution in Local 10 for the boycott of the cargo from South Africa and the brother will is that, is that? I, I think that's later. Oh, that's Maybe later. Okay. Later. Okay. We'll do that later then. Uh, <laughs> later, later. Later, later. Okay. So um, I wanted to briefly talk about the committee, the Transport Workers Solidarity Committee, because uh, this committee came out of struggle. In 2005, uh, there were port demonstrations, and the police in Oakland attacked ant uh, workers in Oakland. And as a result of that, workers were injured, and uh, we took up a fight to defend those workers. And as a matter of fact, the ILWU was part of a lawsuit against the Port of Oakland, the city of Oakland, for the repression uh, against that demonstration. So our committee um, has been fighting against the repression, and uh, it was successful. The ILWU and the people who, who uh, organized uh, the lawsuit were successful in the first union lawsuit against repression. So that was a very important step for the ILWU and this local. And one of the key aspects of the Transport Workers Solidarity Committee is that transport workers have tremendous power in this world. Transport workers have the power to shut down the world. The airline workers, the longshoremen, the railroad workers. They are a key component in the struggle to defend the working class and that's why the repression against the ILWU and longshore workers all over the world. They know that they have power because when they stop work, the capitalists lose money, millions and billions of dollars. So our committee uh, has organized in defense of transportation workers and the most recent struggle that we were involved in was the struggle of the Korean railway workers where they are also fighting privatization by the Korean government. The Korean government, following the dictates of the United States, the IMF and the World Bank want to privatize the Korean railway, railway. And they had a 40-day strike, the longest strike in the history of Korea. Now, everyone has heard about the tremendous ferry disaster that happened in South Korea. That was directly a result of deregulation. That was directly a result of attacking workers and preventing them from unionizing. The attack on the working class is an attack on the public and led to the death of those children and the workers in that port. That's why the struggle against privatization, the struggle against deregulation is for not just the workers themselves, but the entire people, the entire working class of the country. That wasn't what was involved in South, Africa, in South Korea and in South Africa, every country of the world. So uh, we are happy to have had uh, this meeting and we are gonna continue the struggle. And I wanna also say that uh, we, we're struggling for Moses Maikiso, to free Moses Maikiso when he was in jail. And we organized, we organized a committee. How many of you here were involved in that struggle to free Moses Maikiso? Okay, some of you were. How many were you involved in the struggle in 1984? To the long, a lot of you were here. So I wanna thank all of you. We're joining together with our brother from South Africa. We are with you, and it's a great thing that we're able to be here today with you. Yes, thank you. 
I mean, that we're still here surviving this system <laughs> because it's very difficult to survive in this system. And we, we uh, greet Brother Moses Maikiso and let him know that we are with him in this struggle, that this struggle continues and we will be with him in the upcoming struggle, particularly with the ILWU because in July their contract comes up and the capitalists have a plan for the ILWU. They're loading scab grain in the port of Vancouver and the port of Portland with scabs. They plan to attack this union and it's critical that we stand with the ILWU and defend this union against the capitalist attack. Because they know, they know that the ILWU is a key union of the entire working class. It came out of a general strike. It came out of a fight for a democratic union. And this fight that's going to happen is critical that they, they, they be defended by all workers, all workers, union and unorganized. We have to defend their right to keep their union and keep their conditions and benefits. They want to take it away. And this government is with the employers. The Coast Guard was involved in the attack on the, uh, the workers in, in uh, Vancouver, the Port of Vancouver and Portland. Okay, we're going to now go to our panel. We have uh, uh, Howard Keeler, who's a introduce the resolution. And I'll a tape from oh, wait, before we do that, we have a tape from Mumia Abu Jamal we're going to play. So let's hear from Mumia. Okay. Next, we're going to show the videotape that was done uh, about the events of 1984. And ISIS was the one that put it together. So we'll have that videotape. Okay, Howard is going to be one of the speakers and uh, after, after he speaks. So uh, Howard Keeler will be the first speaker on the panel. And you've all seen the, from the video from the video, uh, his role, his important role in this struggle. So, welcome Howard Keeler. I really wish that the 1,000 longshoremen and longshore women who in 1984 voted unanimously to carry out the boycott action could be here to hear <clears throat> from our brother from 
from NUMSA about the new, latest, optimistic stage in the struggle for the liberation of the working class of South Africa. It's 30 years, and many of those uh, brothers, and, <coughs> brothers and sisters are dead. But at any rate, uh, beginning in the mid-1970s, there was an intensive education within the membership of Local 10 on, on South Africa. Very intensive, two different, two different groups, the South African Liberation Support Committee and the Longshore Warehouse Militant Caucus. The Longshore Warehouse Militant Caucus never gave uncritical, uh, 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 any kind of critical support to, my, to the ANC because we understood that as a bourgeois nationalist party, they would be unlikely to carry forward and implement even the minimal elements in the Freedom Charter. Uh, <clears throat> and another thing that we were concerned about <clears throat> primarily uh, was promoting the idea of a working class economic actions against the apartheid regime. We weren't too interested in divestiture. We were interested in trying to, to <clears throat> get workers to take direct economic action <clears throat> to, uh, against the regime. And uh, there was another aspect to the uh, Longshore Warehouse Militant Caucus orientation. During this period, there was emerging in South Africa a very significant movement. That is the organization of independent black trade unions who managed to organize themselves, like NOSA, under very repressive conditions. And they were beginning to create a, a, social, a social poll uh, which had the potential of really challenging apartheid in, in a very real way, and, and we were orienting toward them. Later, <clears throat> after the uh, collapse of the, uh, or the capitulation of the apartheid regime, my political tendency continued to warn that the ANC was unlikely to really defend the working class and would probably capitulate to the enormous pressures that were, that were, going to, that were being brought to bear from transnational corporations and finance capital. We would have preferred to have been wrong, but unfortunately, uh, it turned out <clears throat> that the ANC and the Tripartite Alliance has simply managed capitalism in a pretty ruthless way for the, trans uh, for the transnational corporations. There, <clears throat> Dumsa is, <clears throat> is opening the way forward so that uh, it's quite possible that coming out of this will be a total realignment of social forces in South Africa so that the final liberation of the working class of South Africa could, could, <clears throat> may be something we will see in our lifetime. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Brother Clarence Thomas, former Secretary Treasurer of ILW Local 10 and uh, with the Million Worker March. So welcome, Brother Thomas. Pictures worth a thousand words. Video speaks volumes. If you can't document your history, it didn't take place. And for our young members who are here tonight, this is not made up. As you can see, Jack was looked like straight out of uh, Central Casting. I don't know who's going to portray. Jack Heyman when a uh, film is done on this historic struggle. But before I get into this too much, I'd like for Brother Larry Wright to stand up, please. Yeah. Yeah. One of the first persons that you saw with the waves. I see why your wife married you, Larry. Larry actually went to, went to South Africa, didn't you, Larry? I was in Southern Africa. Southern Africa. I also would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge Brother Cephas Johnson, Uncle Bobby, the uncle of Oscar Grant, and his, 
beautiful wife, Sister Beatrice X. Now, I just want to say one thing. Our president, Melvin McKay, and our secretary treasurer, Brother Par Farless Pete Daly, they have to fly to Vancouver, Washington, because as was alluded to earlier, for over a year now, scabs have been working in our port. What? Those brothers are going to be on the picket line in the morning. So when they walk out, it's not out of disrespect, but they have the plane to catch in the morning. Please stand, Brother Melvin, Brother Pete Farley. Brother Melvin, Brother Melvin was in attendance at Brother Mandela's funeral in South Africa, representing the ILWU. I'd like to acknowledge a brother in the audience, Brother Terry Collins. Would you please stand? Brother Terry Collins and I were students at San Francisco State. Led one of the longest, led the longest student strike in American history. Thank you, brothers. Um, listen, I'm going to try to keep my remarks really short because my wife has given hand signals already. I just want to say one thing, especially to our young members here tonight, those who are remaining. And that is the reason for the action taken in 1984 and in 1977 has everything to do with the history and tradition of this union. This is a militant, democratic, rank and file, social unionist union <laughs> who believe that the social demands of the working class and oppressed need to be adopted by the rank and file. Yes. We're not only interested in good wages, good working conditions, pensions, and all the rest for our members. We want it for all working people. Yes. And it was in that spirit when, when the brother in Fumzi said, a worker is a worker is a worker, he reminded me of Brother Leo Robinson, who believed in that, because it was Brother Leo who wrote a resolution and submitted it right here in this room in 1976 in response to the Soweto massacres. And as was alluded to earlier, that had to do with South African youth resisting the African, Africana language being introduced to them. And they were massacred. And it moved Brother Leo Robinson to write a resolution calling for the boycott of South African cargo. And as Brother Comrade Keeler referred to earlier, from 77 to 84, intense education going on amongst the rank and file, where there were members of the ANC, Kosatu, and other radical organizations that were invited here to speak at Local 10, San Francisco State, and other venues in the Bay Area. It's important to understand that as longshore workers, Brother Leo Robinson had the vision to understand this that we're all interconnected, yeah. and there was something that longshoremen could do in San Francisco that could make an impact on the brothers and sisters in South Africa. Yeah. Realizing that there was an interconnectedness between us because there were some members of Local 10 who raised the question, what in the hell does apartheid in South Africa have to do with us here, Brother Leo, that was a very tough question posed, and Leo had a response. He said, while they are closing plants in the United States of America, they are opening them up in South Africa. 
under the auspices of constructive engagement, which means that if you allow American business to be done in South Africa, that that's how somehow going to change the conditions. Well, that was a bunch of bull crap. <laughs> they wanted to take advantage of exploited black labor. What did they talk about when they said what was on that ship, the Ned Lloyd Kimberly? Steel, glass, things that were once produced here. Leo, Dave Stewart, and other comrades also understood that black people in Oakland, California weren't going to be free until the people in South Africa were going to be free. And there were various efforts, and Brother Larry Wright was part of that, to provide support to not only South Africans, but to freedom fighters in Mozambique, Angola, because we sent containers of supplies. People need to understand that freedom fighters have various kinds of shapes and movements. It's not always just about the gun, although the gun is relevant but also supplies, educational supplies, clothes, shoes, medical supplies, books. This was all provided by ILW Local 10 members who went to our employers, got the containers, didn't charge us a dime for them, because we weren't going to pay it anyway. <laughs> we loaded those commodities on our own time, didn't, we, didn't you, Larry? We had a lot of the uh, organization here by the hall. We had a container here at one point, and we got the community to come down and help out and involve them. This is how you build movements, brothers and sisters. Mind you, there were various tendencies, as Howard Keeler referred to. Everybody wasn't on the same page ideologically. But they did not allow them to, that to stop them from the job that had to be done. I'm going to wrap it up, but I just want to say this. One of the things about ILW Local 10 that I'm most proud of, because I'm a third generation longshoreman, and I am really proud to be a part of an organization that put its, puts its money, beliefs, and actions where, it hard, where its heart is. This is an organization that believes in resistance. We have shut down the port in support of Oscar Grant yes. from Mumia Abu Jamal yes. to end the war in Iraq and Afghanistan yes. against WTO. Yes. This is what's missing from the labor movement today. There are a few of us who are still around and can still tell, tell the story. Some say, is there any left left? It's a few of us that still are. And I'm worried about the future because we can leave a legacy of videos, books, and tradition, but it's up to the young people to take up the mantle and do what we did. We learned from the old timers. I'm going to close with this. An injury to one is an injury to all. And claim no easy victories and tell no lies. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jack Heyman. He's chair of the Transport Workers Solidarity Committee and uh, one of the key organizers of this meeting. So welcome, Jack Heyman. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm going to try to limit my remarks. I just want to clarify a little bit of the confusion. The gift that uh, Mfuzi uh, was going to give to Howard tonight, he actually gave him at my house this evening. <laughs> that was a biography of Moses Maikiso, the first president of the Metal Workers Union. It, it, then at that point, it was called the Metal Workers and Allied Workers yeah. Union. 
Uh, and a tape of the most riveting, yeah, that's the, she has a copy of the tape that, uh, of the book that Howard was given. Uh, and the other thing, uh, we were going to show a clip from a, an amazing documentary about the Maracana massacre. It's called Miners Shot Down. We really don't have the time to do it, but I want to urge you to see it because as Mbumsi has said and Numsa has said, this is a turning point in the history of South Africa, that massacre that took place. So uh, briefly, I wanted to say that the video that you saw about the 84 strike action happened in a particular context that maybe a lot of the younger people in the room may not quite understand, which is we conducted an illegal work stoppage, okay? We, but it happened at a particular time in American labor history that was devastating for the labor movement because Reagan took office in 1980. One of the first things that he did was bust the PATCO, the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Union, and in such a, a very conspicuous, blatant way as, as to have the media show the leaders of that strike humiliated being carried off in chains to jail. That was an intimidating move by the executive committee of the capitalist class directed against the working class in this country, and it was successful because the trade union bureaucracy capitulated after that. There, were, there was quiescence in the labor movement. There was no fight. We were wage slaves without any weapons. And so what happened here in 1984 was dramatic. It was the first time that workers actually rose up in that period and tried to challenge the, the capitalist system. And don't forget, when this was going on, the US government, the CIA, had told the South African government where Mandela was, where he was hiding. They're responsible for him being on Robben Island all those years and then crying crocodile tears later. <laughs> so let, let me just say, yeah, this is a turning point in South Africa history, South Africa's history, and that's what's so exciting about it because while we were able to bring down the walls of apartheid, we never removed the system that buttressed the apartheid system, and that's capitalism. And you can talk to Mfuzi and others, you can read about it. The exploitation is as worse as it's ever been. There's uh, advanced and increased jobless in, in South Africa, homeless, uh, and when I say homeless, I'm talking about people living in shacks that don't have adequate water or electricity. There are massive strikes taking place in South Africa today against the ANC government. Why? Because they were complicit. Before Mandela took office in 94, there was a, what's called a Faustian compromise. And that is the key aspect of the Freedom Charter of the ANC was to nationalize the mines and share the wealth. But they made a backdoor deal that we're not going to touch that. So if you leave the basis of the power for the capitalist class, the white capitalist class in South Africa, you're not going to change the fundamental conditions. What they did is what we've done in this country is put a few black faces, or maybe more in South Africa, in high places but it doesn't fundamentally change the system. Obama as president doesn't change the exploitation that we all face, regardless of color, in this country. And he continues to carry out the policy of US imperialism around the world. This is not my speech, by the way. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so let me... Uh, let me get back to my speech. So there's the, uh, the Faustian Compromise, was, it was a tragedy. But does that mean that it was an accident, that the police just were uh, out, out of control and, and they did some stupid things? Or, or was this bound to happen? And the fact of the matter is, is once you leave in place 
the capitalist system in South Africa, the, the exploitation was going to continue and it was inevitable that there was going to be a clash. As Mfumsi said, the capitalist class and the working class are in conflict. One exploits the other and there has to be a clash at a certain point. That's what Marikana was about because the mines were not expropriated, the wealth was not shared, the exploitation continued, and, and this is, this is the, the, the probably the single most important truth about this whole thing. The former head of the Mine Workers Union in South Africa, a man by the name of Cyril Ramaphosa, he was the head and he led militant strikes against the apartheid regime. When the Freedom Charter wasn't implemented, they picked people like Moses, uh, like, excuse me, like Cyril Ramaphosa, and they put him on the, uh, on the board of directors of Lawnmen and other corporations and financial institutions, and they made him a capitalist. We've seen that kind of thing happen in this country. But not only was, did he make the move from the trade union movement to the other side of the fence, in bed with the cat, he became a capitalist. He's one of the richest men in Africa today, not just South Africa, the entire continent. And after the Marikana massacre, he was elected deputy president of the ANC. So what does that tell you? This is not a party that's going to liberate the black masses of South Africa. The brilliant move that um, NUMSA is making is that they're calling for a workers' party in South Africa. This is a major move. We've been, uh, some of us in this country have been fighting for a workers' party. But what kind of a workers' party? Okay, they're searching around, comparing different things. The Brazilian workers have a workers' party. But it's a workers' party that is breaking strikes. It's a workers' party that removes peasants that are taking over land and giving it back to the wealthy landowners. That's not a real workers' party. Nor is the British Labour Party, which advanced the cause of British imperialism just as well as the Conservative Party did. So there are, there are workers' parties and there are workers' parties. Fundamentally, the kind of a workers' party that needs to be built is a party along the lines of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. That was a revolutionary labor party, a revolutionary party. And they were the ones that made the workers' revolution in Russia possible. The first revolution of workers in, this, in the world. There was, there, was a young, there was a young sailor in 1917 who was inspired, he was in awe of that workers could take over and make a revolution and, and take over an entire country. And that was Harry Bridges. Yeah. Ha Harry, yeah. <laughs> Harry Bridges was won over to the idea of Marxism because he studied the, the Russian Revolution, what it was about. But so we have to examine carefully when we talk about a workers' party, what is the program? Is it, is it a program for a revolution or are we just going to reform the conditions under which we work and we maintain the contract of wage slavery? Or is it a party that's gonna fundamentally change the system, expropriate uh, the, the, uh, the means of uh, banking system, the industry, uh, fundamentally change the whole system. And that's the kind of a labor party that I think is, is needed, a workers party. Finally, let me just say, the ILWU during the McCarthy period, the leaders came up with an idea for uh, 10 guiding principles because they were convinced that the government in this country was going to arrest or deport the leadership of the ILWU. These fundamental principles were you don't cross picket lines. You don't cross picket lines. That doesn't mean that it's just a union picket line. It could be non-union workers trying to organize a union like the port truckers up and down the coast. 
They're mainly immigrant workers. They need unions. They put up picket lines. Longshoremen and other port workers that are in unions must or honor those picket lines. Number two. Number two. Look at the Local 10 Constitution. We do not allow police to become members of the ILWU because they're on the other side. They're not workers. And many left and socialist groups that consider themselves Marxists believe that the police are workers in uniform. That's ludicrous. <laughs> Cops killed workers in the 34 strike here, the maritime strike, and that's what provoked a general strike. That's what put San Francisco on the map as the center of the class struggle in the United States in 34, along with the Minneapolis Teamsters, the trucker strike that was taking place. Um, so, and, and finally, I think uh, a, a key principle in any kind of a labor party, a workers' party, would be independence from the capitalist state. That is, if you've got a problem in your union, uh, 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 whatever it is, and this is a comradely difference that I would have with the leadership of NUMSA, is don't bring your problems to the capitalist courts. Keep it within the labor movement. Fight for Vavi to get reinstated, and he did get reinstated, all right? And, and, and he, he shouldn't have been removed in the first place as head of COSATU. But fights within, in the working class must remain in the working class. We do not want the bourgeois state to, to be the arbiter of our differences. And with that, let me just say, uh, I, I wish Pete and, and uh, Melvin uh, Luck up in, in uh, Vancouver and Portland. Both of those ports have scabs working in them. We've never had scabs working on the docks ever for more than a few hours. We go, we mass mobilize, we shut down the ports and we go in and get them out. That's what has made us militant. And as Clarence said, there's few, very few of the left left in the ILWU. Leo Robinson, Howard Kaler, myself, Herb Mills, who organized the refusal to load bombs to the military dictatorship in Chile, signed a leaflet. I encourage you to read it. It says, ILWU headed in the wrong direction. And that is about, unless we get the scabs off the docks, there will be no real negotiations for the ILWU. Conversely, if Pete and Melvin get arrested, this local should shut down the whole port and call for the coast to go down. Victory to the ILWU. Unite prisonnier d'oppression. I don't need this. Unite de pauvres mondaires. Pour la justice triomphera, un monde nouvel émergera. C'est la lutte finale, restons-nous en ce place. L'internationale seront les gens humains. Unite, ye prisoners of oppression. Unite, ye wretched of the earth. For justice triumphs all privation. A better world's in birth. Tis the final night. No more in trouble. The earth will rise on new foundations. We have been not, we shall be all. Tis the final conflict. Shall we stand in our place? The international working class shall be the human race. Muchas gracias.